Well, welcome everybody. My name is Don Ficken. I'm with the uh, St. Louis Am uh, Astronomical Society in St. Louis and also the Astronomical Society of Eastern Missouri. I'm an amateur astronomer uh, based in St. Louis. And joining me tonight is Tom Lynch, who's a NASA Solar System Ambassador, an amateur astronomer, and a member of the Amateur Observers Society of New York. Tom and I both manage the library telescope programs with local libraries, and we're part of a larger team that's uh, attempting to get the library telescope in public li libraries throughout the world. Tonight, we've got a fun program for you. Many of you are maybe at home with a library with a telescope or are thinking about buying a telescope. And so what we're going to talk about is what telescope is best for me. Now, we are a we will be streaming on Facebook Live, uh, so uh, you can see us, but we cannot see you. And you can and we are recording this, by the way. We'll be posting this later to a YouTube video on our librarytelescope.org page. Um, we're going to hold the questions till about to the end. We think the program will be, the actual presentation will be about 20, 25 minutes. And uh, we, but we encourage you to ask questions. We'll do the best we can to answer the questions. And uh, with that, I think we're going to have some fun. And let's, uh, let's get started with Tom Lynch. So Tom, you want to get us going? Thanks, Don. Welcome, everybody. This is the uh, first uh, online presentation that we've done for the Library Telescope Facebook page. And we're really excited to be starting with this. So I want to first I want to thank our co-hosts, uh, the Astronomical League, the Lindbrook Library, the North Bel Bethpage Library, and the St. Louis Astronomical Society. They've helped to promote this and we really appreciate their help. So I'll do a short presentation followed by Q&A. Um, and I really hope that there's a lot of questions, that we spend a lot of time answering your questions, which I'm, I'm hoping you have a lot of. Uh, I will not recommend any particular telescope or any accessories or producers or sellers, and nor will I disparage anybody either. So uh, if you see any uh, telescopes with their names, uh, that, that is really just uh, there. It's not a recommendation at all. Okay, so moving on. I am a NASA Solar System Ambassador, and uh, basically it's a volunteer position with NASA to promote astronomy and space information. And I need to tell you that I do not work for NASA, nor do I speak for NASA in any way, shape, or form. Okay, so the big thing we're going to do here is look at this flyer that the Astronomical League put out a few years ago. And it's really a lot to it. It says, what telescope is best for me? And it goes through a lot of detail in a very short period of time. So I will uh, go through uh, this, but, but uh, not looking at the page, but going through my slides. The, the flyer was created by John Goss, who was a former president of the Astronomical League. It's really a great place to get information. Okay, so what's the best telescope for me? Well, the best telescope isn't any good if you don't use it, right? So a telescope uh, it's not the easiest thing in the world to use, but with a little bit of effort, you, you can certainly get there. Now, I've heard that most telescopes uh, that are purchased are sitting in a closet, uh, probably for years, unused. So people buy it and they aren't able to use it, which, which is really unfortunate. Uh, why would that happen? Well, maybe it wasn't a very good telescope. And we'll talk about things that make a good telescope tonight. Uh, maybe it's too hard to use. You really have to buy into the idea that there's some effort that you got to put into it uh, to learn how to use any telescope. And the bigger it is, the more expensive it is, the harder it is to learn. So it's good to start with a smaller telescope and work your way up to a bigger one. Okay, now if you do have a telescope like that it's sitting in your closet, Okay, hopefully you're taking this opportunity to take it out and work on it and, and learn to use it. If you aren't going to do that and it's sitting in your closet, get rid of it. Sell it to somebody. Give it to somebody. Don't let it sit there just wasting away. Now, maybe your local library would take it. Maybe a local astronomy club. And we'll talk more about astronomy clubs in a bit. So it's, it's a good idea to just keep it out there with somebody so that uh, it can be used. Okay, going back to the flyer, it starts off with, well, rather than buy a telescope, why not use binoculars, get binoculars, and learn the night sky through the use of binoculars. It's a lot easier to use the telescope, 
And if you decide you're not really into astronomy and you're not really wanting to do this, then it's good for other things as well. So you can take it for bird watching or sightseeing or whatever. You haven't you know, wasted that money on a telescope. Uh, but even if you do buy a telescope, you need to learn it in the night sky. And binoculars are very good for doing that. Now, standard binoculars are like 7 by 35. Probably better to get like a 10 by 50 type binoculars uh, to use. It's a little, little uh, deeper view that you'd be able to have. I have a 15 by 70 binoculars, and they're pretty big. I actually use a, uh, a stand to hold them on because you really can't hold them up for any extended period of time. Uh, so I wouldn't go that big. I'd say 7 by 35 if you've got them. That's a great place to start. Uh, 10 by 50 is pretty good. But after that, they, they get too big. Okay. So what do you want to do with, with your telescope, assuming you get one, right? You've got to have realistic expectations. Tel a telescope, especially a beginner telescope, smaller telescope, is not going to give you views that you would see through the Hubble Space Telescope, which is a picture of that here. Over here is the Voyager 1 spacecraft. And this picture in the middle is a great picture of Jupiter. This is one of Jupiter's moons, Europa, which circles uh, Jupiter. And this is the shadow of Europa on the surface of Jupiter. You will not see this, okay? This is way too much. This is um, taken by the Voyager. Uh, uh, Voyager spacecraft. Now, what you're going to see are things that are a little more subtle. And that's okay. I mean, they're really, really impressive, but a little more subtle than this. It does take effort. You can't uh, just walk out to a telescope and all of a sudden you've got it all uh, figured out and, and you're all set to go. You, you really got to make an effort to learn the sky a little bit, learn how to use your telescope. Okay, what makes a good telescope? Going to talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, one of the ways to get comfortable with the telescope and learn about what telescope you might want to buy is to contact an astronomy club. There's a link here that's on the Astronomical League page. The Astronomical League is an accumulation of astronomy clubs, mostly in the United States, but some international. And they have this listing where you can find a local astronomy club. And for some of us, you know, local might be pretty close. And some of us, maybe not. It, it might be a, a good distance away from you. But don't let that bother you, because there might be somebody in that club who lives around the corner from you, even though the club itself is far away. So uh, an astronomy club has a lot of people, usually, uh, you know, in, in the dozens, if not hundreds. And usually, they are very welcoming of new members. They love to show people their telescope. They love to talk about using their telescope. Um, you get a lot of people interested in, in helping you out. Uh, so that's a great place to start. OK, uh, I'm going to talk real quickly about the simpler telescopes. There's other modifications of these. but uh, So a simplified refracting telescope. So this telescope is much like the ones most people are used to. Uh, you look through the end of it and you point it out uh, and light comes in over here and there's a lens right here that is machined on both sides. It bends the light so that it comes to the eyepiece and into your eye. Okay, so most people, when they think of a telescope, they think of that it's a refracting telescope. There's also a reflecting telescope. And this is the same idea, the light comes in here, but instead of hitting the lens, it goes straight down to a mirror at the bottom of the tube that is machined only on one side, and it reflects that light to a secondary mirror, and it bounces off that up to the eyepiece. So they're, they're, they're different, very, very different in what they do, but the, uh, the whole idea is the same. The light comes in, it gets manipulated in some way, and then sent to the eyepiece. So those are the two major ones. There are others that are sort of a combination of those two. But I'm going to keep it simple and, and talk about only those two. All right, what makes a good telescope? Well, a good telescope needs to have a sturdy mount. Okay, that is essential. Some of the really bad telescopes that I've seen have very, very poor mounts. So the mount is this piece here. This is a Dobsonian mount, and this is a reflector telescope. And this uh, Dobsonian is, is it sits on a 
wood constructed piece uh, and holds everything pretty firmly. These others, you'll see they have tripods. And tripods are great too. There's nothing wrong with a tripod. Uh, the problem is it's, it needs to be a sturdy tripod. Uh, you definitely want uh, a brace here to hold the three legs in together. Uh, it, it's very important that it's stable and doesn't move around. All of these are good telescopes, okay? This is a much smaller uh, reflector here. This is also a reflector. These are refractors here and here and here. This is a combination of the two, and I'm not going to go into any more detail than that. Do notice that it has a, a go-to function here, um, which sounds really good, but that takes some doing to learn how to use that. So it's important that you uh, get comfortable with your telescope. Okay, now bigger is better, right? The more light you bring into that telescope, the better your image is going to be. Okay, now. We know we're not going to be able to use the Hubble Space Telescope, this picture here. Now this here, if you can imagine what the name of this might be, it's called an obsession. And it is huge, right? You pretty much need a truck to move that around. It is a fantastic telescope. A lot of money, a lot of work. If you have an observatory, you'd want to put it there. That's great. People do move them around, though. And that's a possibility. Um, as I said, it, it's a lot to that. So more likely you're gonna get a smaller telescope and that's okay, especially when you're first starting out. There's a lot to see. You know, you wanna look at the planets, you wanna look at the moon, and then you can look at other things as well. You can look at uh, nebulas, you can look at star clusters. There's a lot of stuff to see, galaxies, a lot of things to see. And the bigger your telescope is, the better your view you're gonna get. But there's a downside to that too, right? The downside being that you, have a bigger telescope and you have to move it around. So depending on where you live, if you can go into your backyard and look at the night sky, uh, I can't do that. I live in the suburbs of New York City on Long Island and uh, we're probably one of the worst light polluted areas, or at least at the edges of it, that exist. So I have to drive about 45 minutes to an hour uh, to a beach. Uh, and, and from there, I can do some pretty decent observing. Uh, not the best of skies, but, but pretty decent. Uh, so, you know, I got to be able to move my telescope and that's something that, you know, everybody's got to get used to. Now this uh, picture over here, this is actually my telescope. It's a 12 inch wide reflector, Dobsonian, and it weighs about 100 pounds. That's a lot. And I've had it about 10 years and I think it gets a little bit heavier every time I, I pick it up. So it, it comes apart in each side. The tube is about 50 pounds. The base is about 50 pounds. So moving it around isn't that easy. The bigger the telescope is, the more difficulty you're gonna have in doing that and setting it up. So for a first telescope, I definitely recommend keep it simple. Okay, another thing is magnification. Everybody wants to magnify the, the image that they're looking at and with hopes of getting these fantastic views. And you know, bigger is better, magnification is great, but with magnification, you lose detail, okay? So you, what you want is a lower uh, magnification in the 24 millimeter range rather than the four millimeter. So four millimeter would magnify it a great deal, 24 much less, and there's various ones in between. So a new telescope will typically come with two to three eyepieces, and that's, that's good enough to start with. As you really get into it, maybe you'll wanna buy a better one, maybe you'd wanna buy a zoom, lens, which is much like a, uh, a zoom lens for a camera. You can zoom in and out. It it's basically replaces multiple uh, eyepieces that you add to the telescope. Uh, and and that, that's, that's, that's a good thing, but not necessary. I mean, if you've got two decent eyepieces, you can do a lot with that. Typically, you'd get something like a 24 and maybe a 10 or a 12, or maybe even an eight. There are other things with, with uh, eyepieces, there were filters to put on, and that, again, I wouldn't worry about that in the beginning. You just, you know, you, you probably will be okay with the eyepieces that, that you have. When you start to look at something, always look at the lowest magnification, the highest number. So 24 millimeters, whatever your biggest eyepiece is, you wanna use that, because you can then switch to the other and kind of zoom in on it a little bit, but it's always better to use the bigger one the bigger number with the lowest magnification first, and then 
if you can magnify, depending on your telescope, how much light you're bringing in, how much you can manipulate that light, uh, it'll bring you to, to, to the image that you can see. Okay, the next is a, a finder scope. So a finder scope is attached to a telescope. Um, and it helps you to find what you want to look at. So you would think, like say, let's take the moon. So let's say it's a full moon and you've got your telescope and you need to point it, you want to point it at the moon. It's not as easy as it sounds. If you're going to look just through your telescope, even with a, a very low magnification eyepiece, it's going to be very hard to find. The finder scope is designed to give you a much broader field of view. So where your telescope, in this example here, might see two flowers. Well, your finder scope would see five flowers. So you have a much better shot of finding, your, finding the moon. And if it's properly aligned, you put, put it in the center of your finder scope, the moon in the center, and then you look through your telescope and it's lined up uh, perfectly, which is great. Uh, it does take some doing, you have to do some alignment. So here's three kinds of, of finder scopes. Uh, this one at the bottom is called the Telrad, and this one here, Easy Finder. They actually have batteries in them and they have an LED light. Um, this one, uh, the Easy Finder, has a dot, and that dot, you put that dot on what you want to look at, and then you go and look through your telescope, and it should be lined up, it should be right on that. You have to line it up, um, and there's some manipulating screws here to do that. You would want to do that once, and Hopefully you're okay. If it's out of alignment, you've got to fix that. And that's something that, again, you have to learn how to do. Same thing with the Telrad, except the Telrad has a, a nice circle. Um, I think it has two circles, actually. I used to have used that. And uh, that, that's very nice, too. Again, it's a bigger field of view, uh, fairly easy to use. This one here is sort of a, a mini telescope with a wider field of view. It has no batteries. You know, these other two, you turn them on, if you get to turn them off, you could run your battery down, right? So you gotta remember to turn, the bat, turn, it, turn them off. Here you'd have to do that. It, again, it has to be aligned, but it'll have probably a crosshairs in it so you can line it up to what you wanna look at and then go to your telescope and hopefully it's right there. And again, it has to be aligned periodically. Okay, um, some fun pictures here. Uh, using a telescope is not, uh, something that comes naturally to people. Okay, you need to learn how to do it. And if you just think you're going to buy it, take it out of the box and be a pro at it, you're not. It's going to take some effort. Now this lady here, she's looking in the wrong end. So that's kind of funny, but, you know, she, has, she doesn't know. So, you know, everybody needs a little bit of help in the beginning. Over here, I don't know if you recognize these guys. This is the dynamic duo. And this is a shot from the Batman TV series. So this is uh, Bruce Wayne, uh, Adam West, and this is uh, Dick Grayson, Burt Ward, and they're looking at through their telescope. And you know, this was on a TV show, right? How many people would have been on the set doing that TV show? Probably 15, 20 people maybe. It's got the thing up back, side, back up. So this is the bottom, this is the mirror. Should be down at the bottom. Right now he's looking down towards the ground. So obviously these people didn't know what they were doing and when they set it up, nobody noticed. And, and it's backwards. So using the telescope doesn't come naturally. You really need to work at it. You need to read the manual. You need to make the effort. In the manual, they'll also talk about the finder scope. You really need to read that, learn how to adjust your finder scope so that you can, can see you know, that it's, it's lined up to what you want it to be on, okay? So that, I mean, and again, you know, the more expensive telescopes, even the go-to telescopes, they have to be aligned, have to be uh, set up each time you, you take it out, and it's a process. The telescope that I have, I mentioned before, I, uh, I, it is a go-to scope. I don't use it as a go-to scope very often, but when I do, it takes me a while to get it going. It took me almost a year to be able to do it well. And that, that's more a reflection on me, perhaps, than the telescope. And I was only taking it out once or maybe twice a month. But it took a year to me to really get good at it. And, you know, so there's a lot of effort involved, but it's worth it. I mean, the views that you can get uh, are really, can really be astounding. 
Okay, I want to talk a little bit about library telescopes. So a library telescope is a telescope that the library purchases. Uh, there are some modifications made to it, making it harder to lose pieces and uh, easier to use it. Uh, and then they let patrons borrow it just like a book. So it's a really, really great idea. And it's spreading across the country. There are hundreds of libraries across the country that are doing this. And uh, uh, Don and I have been promoting it along with others uh, for, for quite a while now. And, and uh, it's a great concept. So if you're thinking about buying a telescope, check with your library and see if they've got one to borrow. And that can get you started, give you an idea whether you really are into this, whether you really want to do it, if it's you know, really for you. Because you know, it just isn't for some people. I want to tell you a story that, um, gosh, it's about, I guess I was about 10 when I discovered the space program in the mid 1960s. And I uh, saw a newspaper and it had a, a Gemini capsule on the, on the front page. And I was hooked. I was into that. I got into astronomy. And probably a year or so after that, maybe two, my parents bought me a telescope. And it wasn't a very good one. I didn't know that. They didn't know that. They knew nothing about telescopes. I knew nothing about telescopes. And I couldn't get that thing to focus on anything. I, wor I probably didn't work as hard as I should have, but I worked really hard and I was convinced that I just couldn't do it. I, either it was a terrible telescope or I was an idiot. And, uh, you know, being 11 years old or so, uh, you know, thinking you're an idiot is a lot easier than, uh, than, than realizing that it's a terrible telescope. So I didn't use a telescope again for about 30 years before I bought my first good telescope. And I used that telescope for about 10 years. And then I bought a better telescope and I'm still using that one. So, you know, it can be a gradual process. And a library telescope is a great way to start. It gives you the idea of whether you want to do it. it and this one is pretty simple. Uh, so it, it really is, is a decent telescope and it's not that expensive too. So um, check with your library to see if they have one perhaps. And that, that might be the way to go for at least a little bit. Uh, and if your library doesn't have a library telescope, tell them about the program and maybe they'll start one. Okay, these are various um, links and don't worry about them. I know you, you probably can't, you know, don't need to write, write them down. I've posted this in the discussion section of the event. So you'll, you'll see these links there and you should have uh, no problem finding them. If you do have trouble, you know, you can always put a message in on the Library Telescope Facebook page and, I, and I'll get back to you. Okay. Well, uh, I'm ready for questions. So, Don, I hope you got a bunch of questions. Well, first off, Tom, great job. Uh, we do have a few questions and, and for the viewers that are out there, we encourage you to just post any questions that you have into the Facebook page. Uh, I'm actually monitoring the, the questions as, we, as they pop up. Uh, one of the questions we have is, uh, please suggest a telescope for middle school kids. You want to take that, Tom? Sure. Um, so middle school kids, yeah, I would keep it simple. I mean, I, and I think that's true of any first telescope. Um, you know, there's, there's the refractor versus the reflector, and I, I mentioned those two types. And you probably talk to anybody who owns a telescope. They probably have a strong opinion about one, using one or the other, and it's an opinion. They're both very good under the right circumstances. Um, so a reflector can be uh, a little bit bigger uh, with, with reasonable cost, perhaps, than a, than a refractor. But uh, I, would, I, I really would hesitate to tell you which one to do, but I would definitely take the low end of it, like on a, um, a reflector like a six inch reflector, something like that to start. The library telescope is a four and a half inch reflector. So that's the width of the tube. So that has a, you know, the more light, the better, as I mentioned before, but it gets heavy. And a six inch isn't that heavy. 12 inch, so that, that's the one that I own, it gets, gets heavy too. Um, now on the other side, a ref refractor, you know, the low end refractors are just as good. But be real sure you've got a good uh, you've got a good uh, mount. If it's on a tripod, and, and the reflectors can be on tri tripods too, make sure it's sturdy. You know, buying it without looking at it and seeing it, 
uh, can be uh, can be dangerous because it could be a not a very good mount and it's shaky and you'll never see things. Again, contact your local astronomy club. That would be a great way to start and see what they have. So I, I hope that helps. I, I know I, I don't want to mention specific products that I would recommend to you, more the concepts. So uh, I hope that's helpful. So we have a question here about uh, what objects should a person start with and what objects are visible this summer? Oh, wow. Okay, well, the, the best thing to look for because it's the easiest is the moon. And the moon is absolutely fantastic in a, in a telescope. Uh, I do a lot of sidewalk astronomy, which I well, haven't been with the, uh, the virus out here, but uh, prior to that, I, I did a lot of sidewalk astronomy where I would set up my telescope in a heavily traveled area and people walking by, I would just show them whatever was, a, was available. So uh, you usually would do it when there was at least a first quarter moon, maybe a full moon. And people just totally love the moon. Uh, it's always a, a big uh, crowd pleaser. Beyond that, the visible, the easily visible planets like uh, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Now they're visible at certain times. For the past few months, they've been visible in the morning. For the most part, Venus and Mercury were the evening uh, for a while. But uh, and Mercury is hard to see and it isn't very appealing quite honestly. I mean, it's, it's interesting, but it's small and it's, it's dim. Venus is very interesting. It it's, goes through phases like the moon. It's completely cloud covered, so it's very bright. It reflects light, but it's sort of, it's, it's much smaller than the moon, obviously, but it, it reflects light very well, so it's very bright. Jupiter and Saturn are fabulous. Now, they've been visible in the morning. Um, starting in July, they're going to be visible in the evening, but late in the evening. So by the end of the month, it, it's, uh, it's getting better. But I think I have a, a, a block party uh, where I live here around, on the 11th. And I don't think they're going to be visible until about 11 o'clock at night. But later in the summer, it'll be that Jupiter and Saturn will be visible. And they are awesome. Now, again, you're not getting the views that you would see in, a, uh, you know, in the Hubble telescope or a spacecraft. It's small, it's subtle, but it's awesome to see the rings of Saturn, to see the bands of Jupiter, which are clouds in its upper, upper atmosphere, and to see the Galilean moons. Those are four moons that mm -hmm. orbit Jupiter. And they move very quickly. If you, look, you wait a half hour, you'll see that they've, they've changed position. And sometimes they're in front of the planet, sometimes they're behind it. it uh, they're really, really impressive. After that, you know, I would start looking at um, I'm big on, on globular clusters, which are big balls of stars that are just astounding. There can be thousands of stars, uh, and they're fairly far away. So with a smaller telescope, it might be a little fuzzy. Um, and then galaxies, which are also difficult. Um, but the Andromeda galaxy is a big one that, that, that's reasonably close. And uh, under good conditions, you can get a really awesome view there. But I would definitely start with the moon. And, and planets that I mentioned. The other planets, Uranus and Neptune, are very, very hard to see. And basically you would see a dot, and then you would look at it later and see that it moved. Maybe the next day it moved, and that's how you would know. Uh, bigger telescopes will do better than that, but uh, for the most part, definitely the Moon and Jupiter and Saturn and Venus. Mars is interesting too, but Mars is smaller, more subtle. There's a reddish tint to it, and in really good conditions, you can actually see the white uh, polar ice caps. So, so, uh, so, I, so I got a question here. What are the best aids for locating stars and planets in the sky? The best aids? Yes. Okay. Um, there's a uh, thing called a planisphere, which is a uh, circular map of the sky. And you rotate a piece of it to set the time and the date. And it'll show you what the sky is. So that's a that's a worthwhile purchase. And those are probably fifteen to twenty dollars. You can actually make them. There's uh, if you just just Google Planisphere, you'll find a uh, place where you can print out pieces of it and actually make it yourself if you want. But I, and I will put uh, something about that on the discussion sec section. There's also a, play, a thing called Sky Maps which is a free website. And again, I'll post the, the site for that. And they have monthly sky maps that you can print out. 
And not only does it have what the spot will look like at that, for that month, but it also gives you a list of interesting things to go to look at. Another great place are astronomy magazines. Um, astronomy magazine is the first one, and Sky and Telescope is another one. They have great articles about you know, what's going to be visible or different new things happening, and they have a great centerfold that, that shows the sky, a sky map that's a little more impressive than the one that uh, you get for free in sky maps, but it's really pretty much the same information. So there's a lot of places to, to do these things. You know, the, the astronomy magazines, um, I think they run about $35 a year, something like that. Most libraries have one or the other as well. So you can always go to a library and check it out. Okay, so I have another question here. Should I have a different scope for lunar and planetary and DSO astrophotography? Yeah, well, I, I would definitely uh, not think about photography right away. Photography is, uh, is, takes a little while. Um, and yes, you, you need a good telescope that will track to do photography. Um, because what happens is you're, you're going to bring in as much light as you can, right? So you, you would expose the image for a while. So you have to be able to track the sky to do that. And that's possible in a reflector. Um, but it's more usually done in a refractor and usually a, uh, a more expensive refractor. But once, you know, the telescope that you could use for astrophotography works fine to look at the moon and the planets as well. But some of the uh, beginner telescopes um, probably wouldn't be very suitable for taking pictures. Well, other than, you know, snapshots, which you could take of perhaps of the moon and maybe the planets, but you couldn't do um, you know, things like um, galaxies or nebulas, things like that, unless you have a, a telescope that will track the sky. There are some uh, ways to do that manually, but um, you know, that, that's, that's tough. It can be done. I've seen it done. But for the most part, you, you would need a tracking mount that would move your telescope with the movement of the Earth to keep the object in your sight. Okay, the next question is, how large are the objects such as planets and star clusters when viewed through an eyepiece? So they, they can be pretty small. You know, the moon can fill up your eyepiece, right? Uh, and if you do a little more magnification, you can look and in, zoom into little pieces of the moon. The, when you get to the planets, they're fairly small, but you can magnify it with a different eyepiece and get them to look bigger. But again, you lose clarity as you magnify. So a small telescope pushed to its limit will give you a very hazy view. And even though it's small, trust me, you see Saturn in a decent telescope for the first time. Yeah, it's small, but it is awesome. The class, especially when it's you know, really clear and you, you can see the rings, you can see the, the differences in the rings, you can see the gaps in them. Um, you can see in Jupiter, you can see the bands. It's really impressive. Um, so size is, is good to get something bigger, but again, you're going to lose clarity. And with a beginner scope, you're going to lose that clarity pretty quickly. Um, so how much magnification do you need? Well, a 24 millimeter would be fine for these. Uh, looking at the moon, looking at it, and then, and assuming you have two, and then swap, once you've looked at it with the 24 millimeter, the least magnification, swap it down, maybe it's a 10, you use the 10, and you'll see that, you know, you'll, you'll lose a lot to it. You'll still be able to recognize it, um, but you will lose some, some of the clarity. So you might explain, because a lot of people that I deal with get confused about how the eyepieces are numbered. Uh, sometimes they're six millimeters, sometimes they're 17, sometimes they're 24, sometimes they're 40. So which of those gives you the widest field and the highest magnification? Right, so the larger the number, the less magnification and the more field that you're gonna see, right? So let's say 24, like I had in that slide. So 24 will, and it depends on the focal ratio of your telescope. I don't want to get too much into that. So the bigger your telescope is, the better magnification you're going to get with each of these eyepieces. But again, if, if you 
you start with it, the higher the number of 24 millimeter. I mean, I have a bigger telescope, so I have a 48 millimeter, which I use a lot for um, sidewalk astronomy because it just gives you a really, really good view of what, um, a very crisp view of it, of it. And it can give you the whole moon in the eyepiece as well. So the bigger the number, the less magnification, but the bigger the field of view. The lower the number, the more magnification you get and the narrower field of view. So as you're looking at something, always go with low magnification, the high number, and then work your way down to the lower number and see what you get. It depends on your telescope. It tends, depends on what the atmosphere is like at the time. If there's a little haziness, that'll hurt it. Um, but always start with the big number and then work your way down. Like in a zoom lens, it's the same idea. You start at the highest number and then you can actually turn the eyepiece and zoom in and get down to a lower number. And you, you, know, you zoom in as much as your telescope will allow and still have a, a clear enough picture which will vary from telescope to telescope. So the next question is, do you have to clean or align your telescope and is it complicated? Uh, cleaning the telescope if, um, so in a refractor, uh, you might want to clean the lens on the outside, right? At the, at the front of the tube, if it was dirty for some reason, I'll be very careful doing that. You got, you know, you really don't do it unless you need to. Um, when you're not using it, there should be a cap over it so that no dust is getting on it. Uh, but there are swabs that you can use. Uh, there's a kit that you can purchase uh, that will help you to, to, to clean it off. And they come with um, like a, a plunger that will blow air on it and get to help get rid of the dust. You got to be careful. You don't want to scratch it. Um, so you've got to be very careful about cleaning it. Don't clean it unless you really have to. A ref reflector telescope. The mirror is at the bottom of the, of the tube, right? So you really can't get to it, and you really don't want to touch that mirror. So um, the, the best advice that I was given is if you think your, your mirror on a refractor is, is too dirty, think again. Don't mess with it. Leave it alone. So you generally don't have to clean it. You might have to clean your eyepiece. You know, you only clean the piece that uh, you're looking through. Uh, and again, there are uh, special... Uh, pieces of, of paper and, and a fluid that you can buy that you would use to do that. Now, as far as aligning, the uh, what you really need to align is the um, is the finder scope, and and that depends on the type of fiber finder scope that you're using. You can adjust it, and it's really not that hard. A good idea is to do it in daylight. Don't point it at the sun, but point it at a tree or a chimney you know, a few hundred yards away, get, get the telescope on that and then adjust the finder scope so that they are seeing the same thing. And again, you'd have to read the instructions on how to do that. It's really not that hard. If you don't know what you're doing, like anything else, right? If you don't know what you're doing, it's hard. If you read about it, you understand it, uh, it's not that hard. Now the telescope itself, a ref reflector, has to be collimated periodically. And that's the, you know, the bigger ones. Uh, required more. I had a, a six inch ref reflector that uh, I didn't collimate very often. Uh, maybe I should have, but I didn't. The bigger one, the 12 inch, I collimated every time I move it. And it's really, and again, that's just something you have to learn how to do. It's really not that hard. Um, but again, it, you got to read about it. And I was fortunate. There was a, a guy in our club that I'm in. Uh, I, I, I thought I knew how to do it until he showed me how to do it. And, and, and it was a much better experience once you showed me. So it is something that, that you really need to learn how to do. Uh, reflectors, refractors rather, they usually don't need any, any alignment uh, of, of that. Okay, next question is how far can I see on, in the night sky with binoculars? Oh boy, you can see, you know, I mean, the nearest stars, right, are, are, are four, I think it's 4.3 light years is the nearest star, but that's not a very big one. The bigger stars, uh, you know, are very far away. They're in the hundreds of light years away. Now, you know, you're magnifying what you see. So you're seeing a lot of small stars, 
right? That that uh, that you probably don't wouldn't even know the name of, but you can see, you know, hundreds of light years. Now, what's a light year? Light year is the distance that light travels in a year. So light travels at 186,000 miles per second. So 186,000 miles times 60 seconds times 60 minutes times 24 hours times 365 days is something like 5.8 trillion miles. So you can see pretty far. Now with binoculars, um, you know, there, there are certain things that I, whenever I, I go out in the summer, I always bring my binoculars and there's a thing called the coat hanger. It's a uh, very odd um, asterism, which is a grouping of stars. And I think there's five or six in a row. And then in the middle, there's sort of like a hook coming down. It looks like a coat hanger. It's, it's amazing, but I love to look at that with binoculars. It's beautiful. So you can see that. You can see very far. Now, you're not going to get great images of you know, a star cluster because they're probably tens of thousands of light years away. Clearly, galaxies are millions of light years away. Um, but so, so there's a lot you can see. And, and there's, a, there's, you know, I used to tell people, well, you know, stars aren't that interesting to look at. And stars aren't because they're a point of light. But then there are stars that are binary stars. There's two of them. And there's a whole bunch of those out there that you can see pretty well with, with binoculars. Um, so there's a lot of things to see. Trust me, I, I started with a six inch dot and I used that telescope for probably 10 years. And I never, I, I never ran out of things to look at. Maybe I've got a bad memory and I looked at the same things over and over again, but they were worth looking at too. So we have, a, uh, I think this is just a repeat of the question about the best a telescope for middle school age kids. And there was a question added to that and also eyepieces for those children. Well, when you buy the telescope, it'll come with eyepieces. And the higher, the lower magnification, the higher number, are probably the better ones to start with. Um, and, and what you're gonna find is once you, and again, you know, you go from one to the other. I, I wouldn't get crazy about buying a bunch of eyepieces. You know, the, the telescope will come with two or three, and that's probably fine to get started. If you, you know, wanted to do better than that, maybe get a Zoom one. That Zoom, a Zoom eyepiece is probably $70, $80 that you can pay a lot more, but a standard one uh, is about $70, $75. And that'll give you a broader range. Uh, you can get bigger uh, numbers, maybe I think 28. You see, and the bigger telescopes take a different eyepiece. The, the smaller telescopes take a one and a quarter inch eyepiece. A bigger telescope takes a two inch eyepiece. Um, now there are adapters to get one from the other, so it's not like you couldn't use them. But, um, and again, I, 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 I have Dobbs and I, and I have uh, reflector uh, telescopes. So a six inch reflector would be a good start. And uh, the eyepieces that it come with is probably gonna be good enough. And then as you get, use those two eyepieces, uh, you may, maybe you go to the zoom. Yeah, and I would add, I think that the library telescope's really a pretty good telescope for our middle schoolers. It's easy to operate. Uh, I know that I will do sometimes 100 programs a year with libraries, and usually within about a minute or two, they're able to acquire the moon and look at the moon and, and magnify and find planets and look at Jupiter's moons and start looking at double stars. So I think the simpler, the better. And I wouldn't try to manage expectations. They're gonna see something like the Hubble, but they're looking at a real live image that's really going on. So something simple uh, that's easy to set up with a sturdy mount. These are all items that you've covered here. I think it's a really good start. I would not get into computerized because it's too complicated, uh, particularly for middle schoolers, I think to start with. We want them to use it over and over uh, during their, and once they get good at it, then they, they can advance to the next level. Uh, let's see here, if we've got any other questions. Looks like we've gone through most of the questions that I can see here so far, at least. If there's any more questions, folks, just go ahead and type them in. Uh, we'll, we'll, we've got a couple minutes here, and we're just trying to make sure that we get your basic questions answered. And I'll say why we're waiting for that. I, I would share my story that, you know, just a few years ago, I never even looked through a telescope. And when I bought my first telescope, um, 
I had no idea if what I was looking at was what I was supposed to see. And I tried to get too complicated, maybe with a computerized telescope, and I had frustrating evenings trying to get the telescope to work as the stars are moving overhead. And I haven't even looked at one yet because I'm trying to get the telescope to actually work. So I would say simple is a really good way to go. And you can get a lot of telescopes that are used on the market pretty well, but what you have to do is make sure that they've got a good sturdy mount. Uh, and most of the time, I will say, I get a lot of people walking up with telescopes and they can get them to work. And usually they don't have the red dot, they don't have their finder aligned so they can match what they're seeing and they have the wrong eyepiece and they have the smallest number in there and they need the biggest number. Usually if they fix those two problems, uh, then they, they often can find something here. So, all right, I don't see any more questions, Tom. You have any, uh, any additional thoughts? I guess we could probably wrap up here. It looks like we've had a, a pretty good turnout tonight and we appreciate, by the way, everybody uh, participating. This is our, really our first shot to try to do this and we'd love to hear your thoughts on future topics. If you have those, just type them in. Um, we're, again, we're part of a national team here trying to work with the Astronomical League and other amateur astronomers to get the library telescope into libraries throughout the country. We've got actually over 40 states right now. There's at least one library telescope program in somewhere in the state. So that's great. Tom, any closing comments? Um, you know, the, the, uh, the library telescope, the one thing that's different about that is um, you need a table to put it on. Okay, and that's, that's not a bad thing. That, that's, you, know, you need a sturdy table to put it on. It's a very sturdy telescope, but it, it's low to the ground. And the manufacturer says you can sit on the ground with it and use it. But if I did that, I'd need a crane to get me up after 20 minutes or so. But uh, you need that table. So a decent table is important too if you go that route and have that. I have a folding table that's pretty sturdy that I bring when I use the library telescope. So that, that and, and usually the library is not giving you that table, you know, to borrow. Um, but the library telescope is a great little telescope. I think that's all I got, uh, Don. Thanks okay. everybody for coming in. Really appreciate you, you uh, stopping by and, and looking at uh, listening to us. And I hope to do more of these. Yeah, so the folks that join later in the broadcast, this will be uh, something you can replay on Facebook uh, after just a few moments here. And we are starting a YouTube page, a YouTube channel. And so sometime tomorrow afternoon, there'll be a, if you go to our library telescope.org and go up the top right, you'll be able to click on YouTube and it'll also play out there. So again, thanks to everybody for coming. Thanks, Tom. What a great job you did here. Uh, this is a fun topic, especially when people are sometimes sequestered at home, to how to make that telescope actually work or how to actually buy one. So thanks, thanks a lot, everyone. And thank you, Tom, and all the team for making this possible.